Well, obviously, welcome to you again. Let me welcome in our uh, online uh, folks that are watching uh, via stream on the internet and those who will be watching later uh, on demand. Thank you for taking time to tune in and watch. And uh, how many of you got here early enough to see some of the... Uh, the videos where people had sent in kind of congratulating our, the church on all that. We, we have like 40 or 50 of those. And uh, what's really cool about that is th if you, we'll get them out where you can watch them on the internet later, but there, there are missions pastors and national pastors that we're connected with in places like India and Nepal and Kenya and Ghana and in the you know uh, Caribbean and just uh, Europe, different Romania. It is so cool that, that we uh, have that kind of impact. So I know some of those guys are also watching our service, celebrating with us this first service, this grand opening time, and uh, how wonderful that really, really is. So uh, welcome to whoever's watching, and we appreciate you doing that, and thank you for all for being here and celebrating this with us. As most of you know, our core of our church family had a special dedication service a couple of weeks ago, and, and I kind of liked the way it was. It was um, no carpet on the floor, dirt still everywhere, you know, people stumbling through the parking lot that wasn't done, no lights, anything else. And it's a reminder, as beautiful as this building is, it's not about the building. It's like Pastor Joel was praying a second ago. It's, it's, it's about what's going to happen in this building, and it's about the Savior of which we preach his gospel out to us. So when we think about dedications, I just reflect back on that. I, I said a couple of things there that I want to say to all of you as well. And one of them is dedication is not cheap. <laughs> uh, the, the news outlet, I think, is now left. But the, their second question to me, how much did it cost? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you got to always get, get into that. So um, I just want that to resonate with you, though, for a moment. Dedication is not cheap. When I was... Um, in the 11th grade, uh, I, if those of you who are new to our church, I grew up, uh, I'm a hillbilly from Arkansas, okay? That's just just fact of the matter. Uh, and I wanted to get off the farm, and I thought, I'll become an exchange student, and I'll get off the farm. And uh, so I signed up and got approved, and they sent me to a farm uh, in Australia, <laughs> where I was at. But... Um, when I went to enroll for my classes, I wanted to take the easiest classes that they would have or they would offer because I wanted to go have a little bit of fun, just to be honest with you. And so art was one of the classes that they offered, and I thought, art, finger painting or something, right? No big deal. I signed up for the finger painting class. I want to tell you, I, I, have, <laughs> I have graduated college. I have never had a class harder than art was in the 11th grade in that little community in Australia. But it did a little hillbilly kid pretty good because I didn't know anything about anything uh, that was fine art or the Renaissance period or any of that kind of stuff. But it was, it was quite an education with that. Uh, one name that would just have been skimmed over was a name uh, Giovanni. Well, I move up North East Ohio. That's like everybody's neighbor. Oh, it's Giovanni's over there, right? <laughs> but... Uh, Bertoldo di Giovanni is a name that most people would not know uh, if you're looking back through art history. Hardly recognizable at all. He was a pupil of Donatello. Donatello was the greatest sculptor of his day. All right? Uh, so Giovanni is his pupil, and he rises up, and he becomes the instructor for Michelangelo, which is the greatest sculptor who ever lived. So he's in his... His, his studio and under his tutelage in a day when, you know, you were an understudy and it became a life work. And Giovanni looked at Michelangelo and he could see all that raw talent. But he recognized, you know what, there's a lot of people that skate through life on raw talent who never dedicate themselves and reach their potential. And he was very frustrated with Michelangelo as a 14-year-old who had come to be his understudy in his studio. The famous story is simply this. One day, Michelangelo was just piddling around on a, you know, some little something that was so beneath him, and it made Giovanni so upset that he's just trifling away at something so beneath him. So he marches across the studio with his hammer and just breaks whatever it was Michelangelo was working on, just breaks it into just a thousand pieces. With this statement, Michelangelo, 
talent is cheap. Talent is cheap. Dedication is costly. Let that resonate in your heart and mind for a moment. Dedication is costly. The dedication of this building has been costly to many of us. It's not come easy, but most things in life that are worth having, they come with a high cost, as you would know. And this building has had, it has had some high cost, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. Our journey here has obviously not necessarily been an easy ride, especially for yours truly here. But we are finally here, and I thank God for that. Dedication is so much more than dedicating a building or land, and that's what I took time two weeks ago to talk to our core church about. We, we really, a dedication service is we've dedicated ourselves, not just a building, not just the land that's here, but we've dedicated ourselves. And I reminded the folks that were here uh, two weeks back that uh, of this, that dedication services, um, you know, in that dedication service, rather, that Jesus did not die for buildings, but he died for people. There's not a building in the world worth a sacrifice, in my opinion. I, I don't know a, for any reason, d d if it's just the building or the architecture or whatever, that's, that's not worth a sacrifice. But what happens in these buildings and the life change that takes place in these buildings and the eternal value that goes on inside the building, well, now that's worth sacrificing for because that's everything. So we prayed some big prayers over this new church campus and, uh, and, and in the coming days when you come in, some of you, many of you, we have several hundred cards where you wrote your big prayer and we're going to make a piece of art out of that and have it in here where we can see some of that. But I, I want you to let this resonate in your ears once again, but we're praying for tens of thousands of people to come to know Christ in time because of the influence of this ministry tens of thousands. I don't want to pray for little things. I, nobody wants to be a part of little things. Amen? Little things are not what we sacrifice for and they're not the things you dedicate yourself to and you give yourself over to. We want to pray for this valley of souls to be turned into heaven and escape the hell of which many people are on that path to. We want to stand in that gap and plead for the valley of souls that are here. I want us to have an impact on families that changes the trajectory, the spiritual trajectory of thousands of families. Again, over time, it's not something we're going to do by next weekend, but over time as we're here and the Lord allows us time to be here, that it will just change the, the whole trajectories uh, of families. And I, I would like over time also that this church would give millions of dollars to local and global missions for the great commission that some from every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue would be around God's throne one day. And when all things are known and when we see him, we shall be like him and we'll know what he knows and we'll know that we've had a part in making that happen, that we've had a part in some from every nation, tribe, kindred and tongue giving God praise and calling on the name of the Lord for salvation so all of these things as you would imagine will require a miracle because they're not little bitty things that we can just get done between here and next week it's going to take the very hand of God and I, this has guided my life for, for many many years only people that are attempting something big enough that requires a miracle get to see a miracle let that, let that soak into your mind for a second. The truth of the matter is, the older that I get, and I'm thanking God that I'm getting older, beats the alternative, the more years of ministry that I have, the more that I want my life to be centered around the miraculous. Not the small, but the things that are just the miraculous. There's a phrase in Scripture that you read it several different places and you see it phrased several different ways but it all means the same thing you see it in Jesus' ministry you see it in the disciples' ministry uh, the acts, the actions of the, the, new, the, uh, you know, the new Testament church and there was a phrase that sounds like this they were all amazed they marveled they stood back and were speechless that's the kind of ministry I want to be involved in the kind of ministry, well, in the South, we would just say, well, shut my mouth, right? It's just beyond words. It just, you look at what's happened and you go, what can you even say? We're just amazed. We're just absolutely amazed that this happened. When Jesus calmed the storm with his, with his word, they were all astonished, the Bible said. 
And they said, what manner of man is this that can speak and even the, the, the wind and the sea would obey him? When Jesus cast out demons, the Bible says they were all amazed. They were all amazed. Who would have power over such demonic things? When Jesus caused the, the great draught of fish to go into the nets to the point that it almost sank the boat, the disciples stopped back and said that they were astonished. They were just astonished with it. When the disciples, as, older, as, as they got a little older and they looked back over the ministry of Jesus, of which many of them were writing about and teaching about, and they thought about things like when Jesus fed the multitude with just a handful of loaves and a few little throwback fish, and they thought to themselves, were we not all amazed? Were we not amazed? We were there. We saw what he had, but 5,000 plus the women plus the children and leftovers. Were we not amazed that that took place? And as the old uh, disciple John would say in his, as an ancient old man in John 1, 14, <laughs> we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. The words that describe Jesus' work were words like this, miraculous. People marveled. They were astonished. They were all amazed. Listen, I've survived what looked like a death sentence a couple of years ago in my church family that's here has loved me through all of that I, I didn't get better to just be involved in little stuff I believe God has something great I believe God has something great for this church amen something significant for this for this church to be involved in God has empowered this church to do something amazing and it's not been done in a corner people locally and regionally and internationally have looked and said y'all did this during a pandemic you did this for meeting in a school? You did this when you were sick? And I'm talking, we did this when these things were happening? All, it's not been done in a corner. And what, uh, what could any of us do but just say, but, but God. Amen. But God did all this and has provided for us. Certainly Jesus would be pleased if we, his very body, his church, would have the same thing said about us today as was said about him in his day that people look at what we're going to be able to get done and go, I don't know what to say. I'm just amazed. I'm just astonished. And, and I hope you understand this. I'm not talking about construction. <laughs> I'm talking about people's lives changing. You know, I thank God for the coming week because pretty soon we're going to stop talking about paint, carpet, furniture, and sweeping and start talking about why we did all that. Right? Right? the souls of people that come in. May this community in our world that we engage in look at us and see Jesus in all of it and behold his glory in the midst of all of it. May they too stand amazed and realize God's at work here. This is a miraculous happening. There's something happening at this church. We need to come and see. That's why our first series of messages is simply that. Just come and see. So what do we tell people? We're inviting them to church. Let's tell them to come and see. That's what Jesus told his first disciples. Jesus, what about this and that and where are you staying and what's going Just come and see. Amen? That's the first thing we say to this community. Just, just come and see. Let him reveal himself to them. Well, this campus and this church for many of us is, is all about legacy. Honestly, just legacy. Legacy is what we leave behind us, what outlives us. It's about our influence. It's about the shadow of influence that we can cast for another generation that the dictionary defines it this way a legacy is something that is handed down or remains from a, from a previous generation or time one thing passed to another so we're believing and hoping for the next generation and all that we have sacrificed and all that we have done and those that will come behind us will find our God worth living for and worth giving their life for and serving him I hope as people come in, I couldn't help but think of Joel's prophecy. I'm talking about Joel of the, uh, of the Bible here. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, then after doing all those things, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. May that be said of us in this day. I'm thrilled to pastor so many people in this church that have ministry backgrounds. There's a number of retired pastors that I'm privileged to, that they call me pastor at this time. It's one of the most humbling things uh, in my life. But here's what I know. There are men who've prayed for decades for this valley. And what, by the way, when I meet with them and talk with them, let me tell you the, the common theme right now. They're excited. 
It's just like this prophecy being poured out on them. They're thrilled that what they've been praying for, just maybe some of that could be captured and happen in this church. I mean, they're literally, it's the old men dreaming dreams again, but it says young men will also be seeing visions. Well, I love this, the the new generation coming out of our church. We, listen, I'm, I'm about 32 years a senior pastor. The best group of young people I've ever pastored is in this church. The best group. I see them surrendering. I see them adjusting their lives. I see them engaging the culture and their own generation. And I'm thinking something good is happening here. When they're, when they're getting an idea of what God might have for their life, something good is happening out of that. And that's what legacy is about. I, I, if I made a personal declaration of, of legacy and I think these things are good, and by the way, I'm going to say some. I want you to think about what you might want to say as, as a part of our church. I realize there's a number of guests here uh, tonight and will be tomorrow. But for those of you who've been making this journey with us, what personal legacy would you want to give? I want you to know that I have prayed for my children uh, since the time that I dedicated them with their mother uh, before the, the church that listen, that they would grow up and serve God and would make an impact in this world. And now I just rotate that over to grandchildren, of which I proudly announce I have seven of now. But I'm, I, I want to see their lives, I want to see their lives be impacted. That my grown kids would not just fizzle out one day, but they would impact their children. And this church would have a part of the influence of, of their life. I, I want them to know firsthand the works of God. I don't want them to just talk about, oh, my daddy knew the Lord and he saw miracles. I want them to live in the miracles. They have to be challenged to still be going forward in, in dreams and visions of what God has laid in their life and attempting things great to where they have to have a miracle as well. But it, it takes that dedication for that to happen. I want their lives to give him glory and view that serving him is the highest and best use of their life. I want to see our senior adults at this church finish well. Finish well. I mean, just not fizzle out, but just burn out. Amen? Just in a flame going and doing something for God. Let other people go look at the Grand Canyon for the six months at a time. For God, let's reach this valley. And we go to heaven, we'll be glad we did something for God. Everything that we talk about in that area of legacy and, and dedication, it, it's, it's giving. It's giving of ourselves and our time and our talent and our treasures. We cannot reach our world with spare time and spare change. It just can't be done. And if you're a part of a church or see one doing that, run from that. Listen, I, I don't. Some of you are brand new here. Let me tell you, we're going to call you to sacrifice here. We just are. Welcome home. <laughs> He's worthy of a sacrifice. He's worthy of a sacrifice. God's always developing us. Listen, the building's about done. We just we just mopping up a little bit right now. But what goes on in this building will never be done. The development of us. It's, it's never done. It's, it's never done. So we're still going to have to make sacrifices. We're still going to have to give. Significant churches require sacrifices and significant contributions. They just do. If it's alive, it costs. Amen? Every parent does know that. I'm reminded I can't give anything. You can't give anything except God's already put it in our hands. So... So as I've said those declarations of legacy, I want you to think about this. And some of you are in life groups, you'll hear this question in your, in your study this week. What's your declaration of legacy? What is it? I mean, as we, as we go through this life, is there something that God would like to use you for that's yet to be discovered? Listen, don't glide and float the rest of your life. Find the will of God for your life. And when you find it, know this, it will take courage and it will take faith. And it will take significant contribution and it will take sacrifice. And you'll have to dedicate yourself to it. But if you want to leave anything behind that's worthy of mention here and in heaven, just know it's going to be you making up your mind to do it. You making up your mind to do it. Now with those things said, I want to just finish the message preaching the one thing that we're all about here and that is this the cross of Jesus Christ the cross of Jesus Christ the message of Jesus Christ the gospel is the cross 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
verse 17 through 25. I'll promise I'm going to try not to be long. I've never been able to not do it, but I'm going to try to do it, okay? No, we won't be long. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. These verses are so unique to me. For Christ, This is the Apostle Paul talking to this church in Corinth, a church he helped start, founded, loved. For Christ did not send me, Paul, to baptize but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are preaching, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. If you look, look at verse 21, you don't go to a philosophy class and go, Oh, did you see God in that? Oh, I learned about Jesus at the philosophy class. Or where they were debating about endless things that don't matter. Verse 22 says, For the Jews demanded or demand signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we, Christians, preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews, and it's just folly or foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, whichever one you are, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What the Apostle Paul is declaring here, and certainly what I want to declare as well, he's clarifying the nature of the ministry that God has given him, and it is simply this, to preach the good news. Our mission is to preach the gospel. That's why this building exists. That's why you've given. That's why uh, those of you who are involved in this place, that's why we're here, to preach the gospel, the good news, which the central part of that is the cross of Jesus Christ. I, I mean, that, that's been the central thing for 2,000 years. It, it is the cross. I grew up singing the old hymns in the little old country church that I grew up in, the old rugged cross at Calvary. Think of those songs. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> When I survey the wondrous cross, all those old songs, I mean, that was, the, that was the central part. And still, even the new songs we sing here, we still make the cross and what he did, his death, burial, resurrection, the center point of all that because that's what matters. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my soul rolled away. How many of you remember the burden of your soul? What the burden was was feeling lost. And not knowing if I died, I was going to heaven. I remember sitting in church for like a year feeling that way. What will happen to me when I die? But when I finally realized the cross was for me and I saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. I was saved by faith right there. And you think of all those things. Listen to what Paul told the church at Galatia in chapter 6 and verse 14. Be it, but far be it from me, or God forbid, some translations say, to boast except in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He said, you can say what you want to about me. <clears throat> he said, I've been crucified to this world. The world has no influence on my life anymore. I'm crucified to it. It's crucified to me. I have nothing to brag about except what Jesus has done, and that is he died for me. So in way of outline, let me call it this way, the dynamics of the cross, and it is a dynamic cross. The cross is the heart of the gospel, is the gospel message, the central theme of Christianity. Christ's work on the cross is the pinnacle of God's revealed word. It's everything all included in the necessity of man's redemption. Everything. So I want to go to heaven when I die. What I need to do, go to the cross. Look and be saved, the prophet Isaiah said. Look unto the Lord and be saved. Look, what does it mean? Look to what he did. He died for you. Let your soul look at that. He died for you. He died in your place. We make religion some kind of mysterious thing, and we, in so doing, we make it hard for people to just see the cross. We're to lift up what Jesus did and say, just look at it. See, if you see him, you'll see yourself. You'll see your sin. you see your sin that did this to him. 
and that he willingly laid down his life and died in your place. It's, it, again, it's the central part of, of every part of necessity for your own soul. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul again speaking to another church where I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I stop right there and let me add right here, the foolishness of the cross. The world you and I live in can't understand what we're doing. They can't understand it. Let's just be honest. Most people in Northeast Ohio or this Mahoning Valley are going to drive past this building and shake their head and go, what a waste. What a waste. They'll print in the paper. We spent millions of dollars, and all the people that get on here in this community, I've lived here long enough, know this to be true. Yeah, 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 I can't believe they spent millions of dollars down there. They could have given that to the poor. There's nobody more poor than somebody lost. Nobody's more poor than that. We didn't give just for a building to be here. I will agree with them. If this is just about a building and a place to gather and knock around and play cards and goof around, and well, then I'll agree. What a waste. What an absolute waste that it would have been. But if you understand we're going to preach the gospel from this place, and dead people are going to get up and live again, and blind people are going to see, then, then that makes it worthwhile, does it not? See, that's what, it's, that's what the giving is about. I t telling the people, and, and listen, I, I don't, maybe the news folks know the Lord. I don't know. I'm, uh, they're asking me about the money and so forth, and I said, please understand, this is a gift to this community. We're giving it away. I don't know what to, they don't know what to do with that, right? But to the world, to the lost, it's foolishness. Why didn't you just do this? Why didn't you do this, that? And I'm like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Amen? As if the person saying those things has a soup kitchen in their house. Y'all made me lose my place, huh? <laughs> You remember when they, Jesus is in that home and they broke that box of expensive ointment and spilled it out on his head and let it run down on his down to his feet. You remember what was said? What a waste! What a waste! Why didn't you give the money to the poor? That's what Paul is trying to say. People who are perishing. By the way, Judas was the one who said that. People who are perishing do not understand what we're trying to do. But what we're trying to do is rescue those who are perishing. <laughs> Foolishness in, to the Greek. By the way, it's where we get our word moron. <laughs> it's a true story now. Moron, it's nonsense. People look at, the, uh, look, look at those morons down there giving their money trying to do what they're doing. There's morons. Morons. How can one dying man, a guy died on two sticks, have any bearing in my life in 2021? What a bunch of stupid idiots. That's how they look at us. Y'all know I'm telling the truth, right? But then you have to understand that Greek mind is shunning that message, that educated mind. Many of you are educated. I got, I got me an education too, right? But it's absurdity in the reasoning of the world to understand some guy died 2,000 years ago on two pieces of wood and shed his blood. How does that have any effect on me? Well, Romans 1.16 again, the rest of this verse is, it is the power of God at work. The gospel Death, burial, and resurrection is the power of God at work. This is how the cross is viewed by those who are perishing, right? Those who, but those who believe and have put their faith in it, there's power. There's power. I'm talking about change. Well, here's another Greek word for you. That's where that Greek word for power is from their, their word dynamos. We get our English word dynamite. 
my granddad, only person I knew that I could talk to about this kind of stuff, he had dynamite on the farm growing up and as a young man. And he said that they would, they would blow stumps up to clear fields. And it, this is what I remember about dynamite. Dynamite changes things. <laughs> Amen? The moment you put dynamite in the situation, things are going to change. You, you can count on that. I don't even think it needs elaboration there. Dynamite changes things. It's powerful. Ask anyone who's ever used it. It moves things around. Things that were unmovable before. You know, I, I have plenty of people, Pastor, pray for my husband. He's just unmovable. He, he's from up somewhere up north somewhere in this hard community. Like God can't deal with people like that, you know. He, uh, he's hard. Well, it's involving the dynamite, you see. Amen? It's the power of the gospel, not, not a continual nagging, not a continual anything except prayer, calling them before the Lord and put the dynamite in the situation. But again, someone says, uh, it, it, well, let's talk about the force of the cross for a second. The force of it. So how can the cross of Jesus or his blood change my life? It's the power of God. God says, I've chosen this. My power is going to reside in this message, in this sacrifice. By the way, did I not start the message by talking about dedication is costly? It's the sacrifice that changes things right here. The vindication of the cross is not that it makes sense or it's laced in wisdom or it's reasonable for some mind that's just in the flesh to talk about, but rather it's the power that is at work. God says, my power is going to rest in this, and the power transforms lives. It changes things. I'm not talking about turning over a new leaf. I'm not talking about finding religion. I've lived long enough to see all that just just peters out so quickly somebody's just trying to you know I'm going to make my old lady happy and start going to church you know I, buddy that ain't going to last long it's just not well I'm just going to try to clean myself up and just do better well that's admirable but it's not going to work because there's no power in that the power to see your life change comes from God and it's the central thing of the cross and it, it means that you've got to be converted, transformed. As I thought about this message, I, I think God just had me remember something. Back, back when I was sick, I went back to Arkansas. I was visiting my mom, and I've got a friend there. Many of you remember Larry Pillow. He's a friend of mine from Arkansas. He came up and did a, a, a seminar for us on grief one time, and he helped start Homes for Addiction, and he helped us here as the Esther Home was launching. And uh, just a great man, and he's a, he's a Southwestern Seminary, uh, or Dallas Theological Seminary graduate, brilliant mind, Dr. Larry Pilla, just beautiful man. And he was in the truck uh, with me, and he wanted me to go visit some, uh, you know, we'd call them a rehab place or something like that. But I'm telling you what, so far out in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, they were pumping sunshine into these places. I mean, it's just way out there. Well, a friend of his and mine, longtime acquaintance, gets in the truck with us. They're both older men. I'm chemotherapy sick, and they're too sleepy to drive the truck, and I'm driving the truck, and I'd wake them up every now and then and ask them, where are we going again? <laughs> Directions. But the other guy's name, I'm not going to say his name because I didn't ask permission to say it, but I, what I remember of him as a kid was a guy that was, you know, drunk about once a week, shooting in the yard, tearing up stuff. Just, y'all know that guy, right? And I thought about it this week. I thought, but man, when he got saved, I don't mean when he turned over a new leaf. I'm talking about when he got saved and his life got converted. And about a year later, God called him to preach. And for about 35 years now, or longer, he's been pastoring a handful of little churches, just different ones there. And, and I just thought, as I reflected back on that, you just see two specs. Here's a guy, a doctor of seminary, brilliant man. Here's a guy, just another country bumpkin like I am, but got saved. You understand? I'm talking about saved. Where I don't want to shoot in the yard anymore and break the street lights out and drink like a fish my life is different I want to tell this story about this man 
that transformed my life. I was standing in a friend of mine's business here in this town. Again, I didn't ask permission to, to say who, so I won't. But I, they're here, and it'll be a blessing to them. It's a blessing to me to say it. But I was in their business, and he was looking over the inventory of his store, and he was talking about... Uh, stand there with me and he said you know what a few years ago before I was saved he said this building was broken down there was nothing in it no business and he looked across there at, at, listen a store that's full and people everywhere and began to cry he said but when I got saved when I got saved all this changed all this changed it's not about your business getting better it's about your life getting better amen the building you're in stands as a monument for that very thing. Drove by it, broken down, tired. Well, go through it now. Transformed. Amen? Amen. Right where I stand. Used to be a bar, I think. I know there was one back over in the corner where the kids are being taught about Jesus tonight. <laughs> think about that. That's what conversion means. You and I are debtors to this community. We're debtors. Paul said, I'm a debtor to both the Greek and the barbarian. I owe every man the gospel. I owe every man the gospel. You do too. It's not my job to save them. It's my job to tell them about the gospel, about the power of the cross. I'm closing, I promise. I am right now. We're about done. I'm not lying. I started this message by talking about dedication and sacrifice. It's not cheap. It costs. It costs dearly. Our salvation costs Jesus everything. It costs heaven everything. In a sense, heaven was bankrupt when Jesus left and died in our place. He gave everything for us. Oh, how he must love me and you to lay down his life and I know me <laughs> I can't speak about all of you but I know me he died for me like Bertoldo Giovanni told Michelangelo dedication is not cheap it's costly we the church are Jesus' masterpiece according to Ephesians 2 and verse 10 for we are God's masterpiece he created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago he died for us the idea is simple here do you spurn that message or do you go man that's the power in my life right there that's what's changed my life that's what turned the light on that's why I stepped through the door that's how I heard his voice notice Jesus talks salvation in many many terms that's how I was born again however term you want to use it just know Jesus is always talking about coming to the cross and realizing you were a sinner and Christ died for you and the only way to go to heaven is to come through the cross he says I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me and mark this salvation is a gift it is a gift a gift that must be received or you will be lost for eternity the reason we are here primarily is that message. I just wanted to state it and make it perfectly clear. If you will name me something, anything in this world more important, more important or more urgent or more valuable or more timely than this question that demands an answer from your very soul, where will you spend eternity? Name me something more important than that. Where will you spend eternity as someone aptly has said you may not want to go to heaven and you probably don't want to go to hell but you can't stay here Amen. death is inevitable and there's the only two choices that we're given and God says I'm giving you the choice I'm giving you the choice he's not going to come beat your door down and say no you're going to be saved now he'll go after you if you'll feel conviction he'll speak to your heart he'll try to draw you unto himself but he'll never force himself on you that's not real love amen real love is reciprocating 
Death is certain, but so is salvation. The Bible tells us in 1 John 5, 13, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know. You ask people, hey, do you know if you were, gonna go, if you were to die today, heaven is your home? I ask that to you right now. Do you know that? A lot of people be, will start right here. I sure hope so. He did not give us a hope so salvation. He gave us a no so salvation. I've written these things that you can know that you can have eternal life. It depends on what you've done with the cross. What have you done with the cross? Have you put faith in it? Have you put your belief and trust in that? Meaning there's been a time that you have had God deal with your heart and you knew that he was drawing you to himself and you confessed that you were a sinner and put your faith in him believing he died for you and you didn't turn over a new leaf. You got born again. Things changed. Doesn't mean you're no longer sin. We're still sinful people. But things changed. You felt differently about your sin. You just couldn't go on and keep doing the things you were doing. May we have our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. And just to take time for an invitation tonight, thank God for this place that we can preach this message. Do you know where you would go if you were to die tonight? If Christ was coming back tonight, is he coming for you? It depends on what you've done with the cross. If you say, Pastor, I believe if I were to die today, the heaven would be my home. If that's you, and listen, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I, I, I remember where I was at when I prayed and I received Christ. I, just lift your hand as a testimony of that and say, Yes, Pastor, I believe. I, I know where I was and I put faith in Christ. And if I were to die... Right now, heaven would be my home. What a wonderful testimony of so many hands. You may put your hands down. Maybe you're here and say, Pastor, I could not raise my hand to that. I don't know if I were to die that heaven would be my home. Hey, where else could you, what better place could you be to, to discover that you don't know the answer to that than in a church service talking about that? God's ordained that you'd be here to hear this. If you'd say, Pastor, I don't know where I'd go. But in your heart right now, if you want it to be heaven and you believe that God has ordained you to be here to hear this message and he's speaking to you, may I invite you to pray this simple prayer. Salvation is found in you surrendering your life to the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you. And if you are convinced of that and that's the desire of your heart, would you just simply pray a prayer just like this because the Bible says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord listen for it shall be saved shall be saved would you pray a simple prayer you don't have to pray it out loud just pray like this you can pray it right behind me dear God I do believe that you love me and I confess that I'm a sinner and I believe that you Jesus died on the cross and you died for me you died for my sins I'm asking you Jesus to forgive me of my sins I'm asking you Jesus to be my savior I'm asking it by faith and I'm asking it in Jesus name 